hello everyone. I'm just waiting for my screen to come up. Okay. I must say, as a speaker, it's always a bit nerve-wracking when you're at the venue on time. So I'm still a little bit anxious about um, not being able to get into the meeting properly. But here we all are now. So hopefully I've just calmed down a little bit. Uh, I suggested this topic on demystifying plant names as an introduction because I know the botanical names can be confronting to some people initially. But I think once you know how, what the names mean and how they've been derived, it makes a lot more sense and it makes it easy to remember them. So this really is just an introduction to a very large topic, but hopefully um, even some of our, it is mostly oriented towards newer members. Um, but we'll just see if you can pick up anything. Okay, so in terms of an outline, um, firstly, I'll just talk about some of the basics of botanical names. Um, I really want to focus on the origins of species names. I'll be talking about um, names that are related to flowers, foliage, fruit, other characteristics of plants, and also names that are related to people and places. And there might even be a quiz question or two at the end for everyone. Okay. Uh, just to start with the basics of botanical names. Uh, why do we have botanical names in the scientific system of naming um, both plants and animals? Well, it really ensures that each plant has a unique name and that means that people can communicate clearly about plants, both for research and study and using plants. If we used common names, well, firstly, some Australian plants don't even have a common name. Um, other plants can have lots of different common names and then sometimes the same common name can apply to lots of different plants. So it can certainly get very confusing. The other benefit of our names between plants and that also makes it easy to, um, to understand them as well. Uh, so the, the system of scientific um, botanical names that I'm talking about tonight is known as the binomial system and that was formalised by the Swedish uh, botanist Carl Nace um, back in 1753 and that name binomial gives a clue as to what it's about. It's a naming system that has two parts. Uh, the two parts are the genus name and the species name and a great way to illustrate that is my old favourite of course, Banksia serrata. Uh, we have the, the genus Banksia named after Joseph Banks and the species name of serrata reflecting the serrated leaves of the plant. Now the naming system is Latinized, that, but it is based on both Latin and Greek works. So there's a bit of sort of manipulation of the words sometimes to make them fit this system. And one of the sort of peculiarities is that the genus and the species name have to agree in terms of their gender, which is not something that we have in English, so it doesn't really make much sense to us, but it means you have acacia ending with an A and then the species name will also end in an A to match. Um, and same with Cerepetula and Gamiferum, but there are certainly plenty of cases where that doesn't occur, so don't worry too much about that. Um, I won't be talking about cultivars uh, tonight, but there are also conventions about naming cultivars and how they're expressed in single quote marks, uh, like Banksia pygmy possum, which is a prostrate form of Banksia serrata. And when you think about the fact that the binomial name system started back in 1753, what that means is there's been well over 250 years of plant names being created and used. And that means that plant names have changed over time with more research and discovery. Um, and also because people have realized that plants have been named before. Um, so there's a lot of, just because the name exists at one point in time doesn't mean that's the name that stays with the plant. And related to that sort of 270 year history of plant names is that plants have been named by very many different people over time. And all those people have lots of different experiences and some people were naming plants, naming Australian plants without even having seen perhaps a specimen of the plant growing in the wild. and might be relying just on a drawing or a dried specimen. 
And because of the history of how plants have been named, it unfortunately means that there are very few Aboriginal names that are used as botanical names for our Australian plants. Uh, but the key feature, and this is the most important thing, is that the names, the species names in particular, refer to particular characteristics of plants or some connection to the plant. And the names are mostly logical, but sometimes the people naming them have been very creative and it can be a bit obscure to work out exactly what the connection is between the name and the plant. And there are lots of different reasons why that can happen. Um, new plants are being discovered all the time, but a suitable name might already be taken. So you can't call every single plant that has a small flower or a small leaf. You can't give that the species name Minor, even though that might be the really obvious name for that plant. So what I want to talk about in the next few slides are what I call the common components of species names. And one way to think about that is to think of species names, which might be just a one very simple one word description or adjective like minor, which means small. Um, but a lot of species names are a combination of what I call prefixes and suffixes. And we'll have lots of examples of those coming up. And once you grasp this is how it works, um, lots of things become, hopefully will become a lot clearer. Just before I get on to species names, I will just talk briefly about genus names. Now there are many sources um, for genus names. A lot of um, genuses or genera are named after people, both um, English people and also Europeans. So uh, the Banksia genus was named in 1782 by actually the son of Carl Linnaeus, who came up with the binomial system in the first place. Uh, and then Grevillea was named after um, an English patron of botany who was a contemporary of Joseph Banks. Um, and it's very, you can do a whole presentation just on people um, involved in botany who've given their names to different uh, genera. Um, other, other genera might be named after particular features of the plant. And you might remember from my acacia talk, uh, acacia is named from a Greek word referring to the sharp point that a lot of the acacia species have, particularly in Africa. But moving on to um, species names in particular, um, many names refer to a feature or characteristic of the plant. Now that can be quite, cover quite a wide range of things, from things that are really obvious like the flower and the leaf and the fruit and the seed, uh, but it also might refer to uh, the texture, the shape or the habit of the plant or even where it, it tends to grow. Now I've said the feature may be distinctive or not. Well, if you think of it as a feature, yes, it should be distinctive, but you might have to look, it mightn't be the most obvious feature uh, that the plant is named after. Uh, and the feature and the name of the plant may not be unique to that plant. So a bit like the minor, um, there are lots of plants that have long leaves, but, but the species aren't all called longer folia. Uh, and as we look at some examples of the origins of names, you'll realise that for even um, a feature like long leaves or big flowers, you can actually describe that feature in lots of different ways because you can use a combination of both Latin and Greek origin words. And my tip to try and make sense of some of these Latin and Greek words is to think about how that word might still be used in English today. And one of the sort of tips I think that is Although a lot of our English words that we use today have come from Latin, often the Latin sort of version is what you might call the more formal or less common word. So we just might say pointed in English, uh, but that comes from the Latin word pungens. And if you think of the word pungent, well, that's the word we use in English to mean something particularly sort of sharp, whether it's not, some, not always something physical, but maybe sort of a pungent aroma. So it's very sort of sharp, pointed and intense. Uh, as I mentioned before, names have lots of common components. So once you learn to recognise those, you can then do what I call mix and match, where you can match up a prefix 
and match up a suffix to form your own um, species name and work out what they all um, mean. Okay, so what I wanted to do is just talk about some common prefixes. So these are the, the bits of the word, bits of the species name that are the beginning of the name. So if you think about things like how we describe numbers, um, uni means one, but if you want to uh, describe something that comes in twos or pairs, you can use by or di, and even for four, um, quad or tetra. And often where there are different options, um, it just reflects that one word might be from Latin and one word might be from the Greek. Uh, so you can see for size um, and position, uh, we've got you know, macro and grand, both describe something that's very large. Um, and a word, a, a prefix like D can mean, some, can sometimes mean things like down or away or from. Um, so you have to sort of see how that's used with the suffix to see how that um, forms a species name. There are also a couple of other prefixes which are handy to look out for. And the simple letter A, which is also sometimes used as AN or ANA or even AB, can mean no or without. Uh, so that's one to look out for. Um, and things like um, hetero, which is different, or allo or adol, or as meaning something that's similar. And the photo there, um, and what I've used throughout this presentation is a lot of photos from our coastal plants at the Royal National Park CD, which is a great resource. And I'm just so thankful we have that available. Uh, so this is Dodonia triquetra. So the tri tells you that something about that plant is in threes. And when you look at that um, fruit there, you can see it's actually got three, it's a three-sided fruit. Actually, I've got my mouse, I can sort of point out if you look at each of these individual ones, they've actually got three sides. Now, I think probably some of the easiest prefixes to get your head around are the things about colours. And sometimes the colour can just be a single word as well. And sometimes it's used as a prefix with something else. So again, just for a colour like black, there can be, um, a prefix starting with mela, and that gives us words like melanoma. Um, and then also words that start with NIG are also used for black. And when we come to white, uh, different, three different prefixes that all mean white. Um, L-E-U-C, which again gives us um, leukemia, which is a, uh, an excess of white blood cells as a disease. Um, and then Aramophilin Nivea, you think, well, if Niv and Nivea means white and that has bright blue flowers, how does that work? Well, it just means the Nivea might be referring to the whitish, perhaps bloom or colour of the leaves. So it's not always applying to what you might think is the most obvious colour. And what I think is a really interesting group of um, prefixes are about the colour yellow. And again, anything that has a Y in it tends to be from Greek, um, a Greek origin. So Ys and Xs tend to be um, Greek rather than Latin. And that's why we have a few different words for yellow because they're coming from both Greek and Latin. And if you did chemistry at school, you remember that the chemical symbol for gold is AU, and that comes from the Latin word for gold. So um, that's a, a U R um, means a gold or a yellow colour. There are also lots of different prefixes for the colour red, depending on whether it's sort of red, rosy red, rusty red, blood red or orange red. Um, and then also green. So there aren't actually a lot of Australian plant names that seem to be named after green colours. But if you think about how we use the word today, like verdant, um, that comes from this origin, the V-I-R, the V-E-R, meaning green. 
no, excuse me, a bit croaky. Uh, and blue, um, so cyan. And if you think of our native comelina, which has the blue flower, that's how I always remember which one is the native one. The CC, the comelina cyania, has the blue flower. Okay, so lots of different colours, that's just some of them. And what I wanted to talk about now were what I call the suffixes or the, what tends to be the end bit of the, the species name. Now, you won't be surprised to learn that there are parts or some parts of the plant, there are several different names, again, depending on um, the origin. So while flora is an obvious word for flower, giving us words like floral, um, anth, for sort of antha, stamen and styla are also used to represent the flower or parts of the flower and folia from the Latin or phylla from the Greek to mean leaf. Um, other interesting um, suffixes defining the fruit or the seed can be words like carpa or carpus, sperma or spermum, um, spora and even Gyne, um, which refers to the, the fruit or the, the part that contains the seed. Um, and that gives us words like um, gynecology, um, referring to ovaries containing um, seeds. Uh, what else do we have? Cephalus or cephala for head. Um, and if you've always wondered what pogans are, <laughs> they refer to beards or hairs. There are also some other words for hair as well. Now, there are some other endings which are really handy to look out for as well. So anything that ends in oides means it's like something else. If it ends in ensis, that usually refers to a place. And if the name ends in something like ferro, it means bearing or carrying. Um, and we'll have a look at some examples of these in a minute. And I've just got a photo there of the Acacia binovata. And if you look at the leaf, you can see it has bi, which is two veins, the nerve part on the leaf. So that's a two, two veined leaf there. Okay, so now we get to do the fun bit where you mix and match the prefixes and the suffixes to form uh, species names. So if you have A plus phylla, you get without leaves, and that's how we get acacia, that name uh, you can see refers to acacia A phylla, which at first glance looks like it doesn't actually have any leaves. But if you have micro with a phylla, that would describe a plant with small leaves. Um, what else we've got? Um, Macrocarpa for big fruit, um, say Melaleuca quinquinervia with five veins. We have um, quinque, five plus nervia. And then our two words, um, bearing. So we have, say, Xantheria re resinifera, it's bearing resin, and the indigophora is bearing um, indigo or purple flowers. Uh, so I talked about combining prefixes and suffixes into words. You can also just have single words as descriptors. And I might just go straight to the example there of um, the word maculata. Now that comes from a Latin word, macula, meaning sort of spotted or blotched. And when you think about how we use that word in English, well, we haven't the eye disease macular degeneration. And then we also have the word immaculate, which actually means without spots. So it's taking that, uh, the root and then adding the in or the in, meaning the opposite in front of it to get spotless. Now how that's used in a species name, we have Eremophila maculata, which refers to spotted flowers, but then it's also used to refer to the mottled bark on a corymbia. Uh, another example of just a sort of a single descriptive word is undulatum, which means wavy. And if you think of the English words or how we use that in English, which again, is not a common sort of expression in English, 
Um, you might think of undulating hills. And so if you look at the leaf of that very common Botosporum, uh, actually I've got my mouse here again, you can see that the leaves are wavy. Now, of course, not every plant with wavy leaves is called undulatum, but that's one way to remember that one. Now, just talking about some examples of names about foliage. Uh, some names about foliage will have filler or foliar in them. Uh, and then other names might just refer to perhaps some aspect of the leaf like the tip, in the case of Grevillea micronulata, and you can see the little tiny tips on the leaves in this photo here. Um, Banksia integrifolia means the leaves are actually entire or integral without having any spines or margins or waves or anything. And then for Banksia marginata, uh, that refers to the fact that the leaf margins are actually slightly um, curled, curled under. Now this is a funny category of names here where we have names about foliage where the foliage looks like something else. Now if you don't know what the something else is, it can be a bit tricky. So I actually have no idea what this South African Pedalaria genus looks like, apart from the fact that it obviously looks like Acacia pedalifolia because it's been named after that genus of plants. Uh, and Grevillea buxifolia is because it has leaves like a buxus. Uh, Melaleuca thymifolia has leaves like thyme. And then we come to our endings of oides. So Ariostin and Myoporoides is like a myoporum, and Pultonia daphnoides has, has leaves like a daphne, apparently. And Leptospermum and arachnoides is so spiky, it looks like a spider. Uh, while a lot of names are about really visible things like flowers and leaves, there are some other types of names. So some names refer to the scent of a plant. So citriodora uh, means um, it's lemon scented, uh, the lemon myrtle there. Uh, there's also a lot of plants that refer to how showy or beautiful the plant is. And I just wanted to give, give this as an example of, um, this is like the Latin speciosa means showy, but in English we would say very showy or the showy s to mean the superlative. And so the waratah has isima to mean the superlative. It's not just speciosa, it's speciosissima, it's very showy. Uh, and things like excelsa for the Gynia lily also refer to um, that, that high, high standard and quality. Um, what else do we have? Um, another example of where it's handy to think about how the word is used in English is the growing species names that refer to the growing habit or size of the plant. So, both of these two are climbers and scandens means climbing, referring to a vine sort of climbing and scrambling. And if you think of the English words, you can see the heart of the word there in ascend, sort of going up, climbing up and descendant related to sort of going down. Uh, some other names about bark, so squamosa, uh, refers to the scaly bark. You might want to think there about if you've had any skin cancers taken off recently. Um, that gives us um, SCCs. Uh, some species names refer to the texture of a plant, whether it's the texture of the leaf um, or an aspect of the flower. Uh, and then also some names about whether the plant is considered edible or not. So I think people were obviously quite pleased when they first tried Ostromertus dulcis berries. So the Aboriginal name was known as the midgen berry, but the, sweet is the fruit is particularly sweet. And so that's why the species name is dulcis because it's referring to how sweet and edible the fruit is. You might think about how we use the word um, dulcis, so we use it to say dulcet tones. And then another 
word to sort of express sweetness is the glycophila in um, Smilax. And you can think of words that we have in English that start with gliss, like glycerin, uh, to mean sweetness. On the other hand, it's not so palatable like the native currant. The acida refers to how sour the fruit might be. Okay, um, just a few um, names that refer to places where plants are found. So a common ending that refers to place names is ensis. So acacia chinchillensis comes from chinchilla in Queensland. And so if you know where chinchilla is, that gives you an idea about the sorts of conditions it likes. And the one name that I could sort of think about that actually came from an Aboriginal origin is Banksia croaginogalensis, which is found in Croagingalong National Park, right on the eastern um, it's right near the border of New South Wales and Victoria on the coastline. And that is derived from Aboriginal words meaning belonging to the east, which makes sense considering how east the landmass is. And then other species names that refer to the type of place or the habitat where the species is found. Uh, an example might be Lamandra fluviotalis, uh, which is found near water or rivers, and we have lots of words in English that start with F-L-U-V for water or rivers. Uh, there are some species names that are named after people, and it won't come as any surprise that most species names <laughs> named after people are named after male people. Uh, Joseph Banks has about 80 species named after him, Banksii. Um, Acacia brownii is named after collector Robert Brown and a more recent plant named after a person but also named for the stature of the plant is our, our Wollamai pine. A couple of uh, other interesting examples. Uh, there is a, a local eucalyptus in Sydney which is named after Joseph Basisto who was a pioneer of the eucalyptus oil industry and in this recent um, era, you might have been spraying um, bottles of eucalyptus spray around. Um, so that's an interesting one. And there is an Oli area, which is a daisy bush named after a botanical artist at the Botanic Garden, Mark Flockton. Okay, what have we got next? Uh, some tricky names. Okay, just to sort of off. Uh, some of these tricky names, um, where on earth do they come from? Uh, as you might know, I am very keen on my yellow flowers. Uh, yellow buttons, it sounds like a mouthful, but when you break it down, it all makes sense. So the chris means yellow and the cephalon means head. So that means yellow heads of flowers, okay? And then the apiculatum, apparently refers, if you look really closely, to a tip on the leaf. Now, this is another interesting example of how when words change from Latin to English, apex, when the word has bits added to the end of it, often that changes to an I and a C, just like index becomes indices. So that's how you get apiculatum, referring to an aspect of the, the tip. And another yellow related plant, which was in our newsletter last month is, sounds like a mouthful, Xanthostomum chrysanthus, which again, because it's such a spectacular plant, and when you just look at it, all you think is, my God, that's a spectacular yellow flowering plant. So the genus name refers to the yellow flower's name, also refers to the yellow flower. So you're really getting a double dose to really emphasise this plant is about yellow flowers. Um, now when it comes to the woody pear, uh, that name is all about the fruit. Uh, when it comes to blueberry ash, now we mightn't think that the blueberry ash really looks like an olive, but that's what the name refers to, an olive-like fruit. And the reticulatus refers to the network of veins on the leaf. And that gives us words like, well, we have other words related to that, like reticulation, which is a, a network. 
Uh, and then another example, Calicoma serratifolia, where the genus name refers to the beautiful hairs. And I think you can see a few hairs down here on the dead flowers. Uh, and then of course the serratifolia on the leaves. Okay, now this is going to be my quiz question, but I've realised I won't really work because everyone's muted, <laughs> which might be actually to everyone's benefit anyway. Uh, so if you saw this, came across this plant, and you're trying to work out what was the more likely name, do you think it would be more likely to be called Lomandra obliqua? Where obliqua, you're thinking, mm, what does that mean? It means a bit asymmetrical, Bit different, off centre, not quite straight, or would it be Lamandra filiformis? And you're thinking, okay, filiformis may be related to something thin, filiformis. Okay, so Rhonda, Rhonda, before you go on, we can do a, a poll if people get their participants up and <laughs> have a yes and a no button. Oh. So you can ask your question and we can have a go. Well, who thinks it would be Lomandra obliqua? I'll leave you, Ralph, to do the counting. Yeah, well, everyone can just click on the, the green tick for yes or the, the uh, red cross for no. <laughs> now, I did try this out on Bruce earlier and um, maybe it wasn't the best example. <laughs> so... Have we, have we got any voting there? Who votes yes for Lamandra Obliqua? Yeah, we've had some people voting. I think there's still people working out how to do it. How do you do that, Ralph? So if you click on the participants um, at the bottom, you'll get a list of everybody. And at the bottom of that list, you've got some buttons that you can click on. There's a green one if you think it's Obliqua. And a red one, if you think it's um, filiformis. I can see right, a few people you. starting to vote now. That's good. We've <laughs> probably got about half the people have voted by now. Most of them are going for obliqua. Yes, yes. So, so your, your lesson has worked, Rhonda. Congratulations. Well... Yeah, maybe. So, and then we have another chance. What about this one? So, if you knew it was a bassoonia because that's a bassoonia flower, but you were trying to remember of all those vague, you know, species names you'd heard to do with bassoonias, you know, would it be lanceolata or pinifolia? So, if you think it's lanceolata, click on the green tick. <laughs> and if you think it's the other one, click on the red button. And it looks like we've got, everybody knows what they're looking at because everybody has said pinifolia. Yeah, because when you look at that foliage, it is pine-like foliage. Whereas lanceolata refers to a more sort of lance-like shape, which is actually broader. Now, this has obviously been a very, very quick overview, but I hope I've sparked people's interest in finding out more and of course we have our bible the field guide of native plants of sydney which is fantastic for explaining names uh, and our coastal plants of the national park cd is also a fantastic resource and a book that i came across last year is this one called the dictionary of botanical names which just has um, 3,000 sort of genus and species names in it, which gives you a bit of an idea. There are lots of other books available. I also came across one from the UK, which was really simply and beautifully laid out. But it actually also highlighted that the naming of our plants is actually quite different from plants that are sort of quite common in the UK. They seem to have a lot more names about sort of habitat and where plants actually grow. But anyway, um, and so my final slide is that I hope I've convinced you that plant names, it all makes sense, more or less, uh, taking into account how the names have sort of come about over 250 years. Um, if you look at the plant, 
just think about what are its noticeable characteristics. Uh, think about the origin of the botanical name when you do look a plant up. Um, and if you're having trouble remembering some of the Latin and Greek words, uh, just think of links to English words to help you remember them. And just think about how you can use the name origins to identify and remember species. So just to finish, we have Banksia marginata, named after the leaf edge. We have Tilopia speciosissima, named because the flowers were so showy and you can see them from afar, giving it the word Tilopia. And then the final one, which is a really sort of, I thought quite a, an interesting one. So Acacia brownii is named after a person and the very similar looking one when it's not in flower is Acacia ulicifolia and it has the cream flowers and it's named after, well it's named after the genus Ulex because it has Ulex-like leaves. Now obviously Acacia brownii also has Ulex-like leaves but depending on which one got named first, like maybe the name had already been taken or maybe someone named it after the person then they found the other one that come up with a new name. So there's all sorts of reasons why a plant mightn't be named after what you think is the most obvious feature, but there is something there. You just have to um, sort of look into it and then make the link to help you remember it. So that's um, a very quick overview. And I know we've had a lot of, we've got a lot of experienced people uh, watching tonight. So um, I hope it hasn't been too simple. But I know a lot of new members often say that the names are hard to understand. So I think if we make people who do understand names can make more effort to sort of try and share some of that knowledge as other people have obviously shared it with me um, years ago, um, we can help um, people make sense of the names. Uh, so what I might do now, Ralph, is stop my screen sharing and maybe have some questions. Yeah, thank you for that, Rhonda. I actually.